Good morning. So I want to start by sharing a little story, but we're going to be in Ephesians 1 and 2. So if you guys have your Bibles, you might want to open there because we're going to be looking at that a little bit today. Ephesians 1 and 2, but um, a couple Sundays ago, I was getting ready for church and Julie always is watching uh, something in the morning before as we're getting ready. And she used to watch um, Blackhawk in the mornings as we're getting ready. And, uh, but lately we've been listening to Charles Stanley. Um, some of you know Charles. Some of you know his son Andy Stanley. Anyway, Charles has this service. They put it on TV. And I'm getting ready. And I'm walking through and it's Charles Stanley, but he's not there. It's, uh, it's some other guy. And when we used to watch Blackhawk, you'd always be like, Oh, Kelly Bird would be there, but then when he was gone or something was happening, they'd have somebody else. And you're like, oh, it's, it's the B team, right? And so I'm walking through Charles Stanley, and it's not Charles, and it's some other guy, and I'm like, oh, it's the B team. And I'm not missing the irony here because I'm not Rick, so I'm the B team. <laughs> but as I'm walking through, I'm like, oh, well. So all of a sudden, I start to hear what this guy's saying, and I stop. And then for like five minutes, I'm just listening to this guy. I'm like, I don't know who this guy is, but this guy is really good. And I said, Julie, who is this? She goes, it's Louis Giglio, which I don't know if you know that name, but he's not the B team. <laughs> Louis Giglio is A team, right? Uh, but it was apparently his birthday or something, and so they had asked Louis to come speak. And, and as he's talking, he said something that really stuck. It just really stuck with me. He said... What is the power of the gospel? What's the power of the gospel? And as I was thinking about that, it really starts to, I'm thinking, okay, I think I know the answer, but where is he going with this? Because I start thinking about what have we reduced the power of the gospel to? You know, you know what the power of the gospel is, is it's, it gives us the ability to be righteous so that we can then judge other people because they're not doing it right. Or it's going to help me be a better person. That's the power of the God. You know what the power of the gospel it is? It brings people to church. Or it's going to fix my relationship. You know, the power of the gospel is it gives me a chance to have more blessings on life in life now. And I'm thinking, you know, that's what we've kind of turned it into. And I started thinking, you know, maybe that's why sometimes we're a little bit embarrassed to be like, let me tell you about the gospel. Because we've turned it into something else. Or, I would invite you to church, but is there really anything there for you? Because, you know, it's, it works for me, but... But then Louis Giglio said this. Let me tell you the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is that Jesus brings dead people to life. The power of the gospel is bringing the dead to life. Can't get an amen on that. That's incredible. That's something to get excited about. You know what? I've gotten so caught up in our culture, I forgot. The power of the gospel is to bring the dead to life. That's what we have. That's what we can share with other people. And then I was like, yeah, the power of the gospel is to bring the dead to life. All right, Louis, Louis Giglio. So, and I know some of you are still stuck on, but wait a minute, the gospel does some of those other things fixes relationships and helps me be a better yeah because guess what those things happen to people who are alive when you're dead those things aren't happening so yes the power of the gospel is to bring the dead to life and we're going to start in ephesians 2 verses oh here what's this the power of the gospel to bring the dead to life so smile about that relax you guys are alive today all right ephesians 2 Verses 4 to 5. Be, but because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. It is by grace that you have been saved. And if you, go to the, if you are in your Bibles and you look at Ephesians chapter 2, the very first couple words in there say, what? Look at it. You're dead. You were dead. But he made us alive. 
And now this is, this is how God works. So the passage that I'm preaching out of today is actually in Ephesians 1. But Ephesians 1 and 2 is this whole thing. I'm reading it all together, and then this verse comes up. And it's kind of mirroring what I'm thinking. At least what God's been putting in there. And I apologize. I'm going to apologize a lot today. First of all, I'm the B team. Second of all, I haven't been sleeping well lately, so I got all these random crazy thoughts in my head that God's been like, hey, listen to this, listen. And I'm like, yeah, okay, God, but it's got to make sense, right? So if I get a little random, just bear with me. But today, we're talking about this. So I want to know. Oh, no, I've gone too far. We're going to talk about who you are, who you are in Christ. Um, And I want to think about this because a couple weeks ago, um, at the beginning of the school semester for Huntington University, they had this thing called an intensive. They invite people back or they're taking classes online, but they have this, they have to come to campus for this intensive. And uh, there's a friend of ours named Becca. She was a student at Huntington University. Then she worked there. She worked with Julie. She's moved to Atlanta and she's coming back. And Julie's like, well, you can stay with us because the girls are gone. We have extra bedrooms. Becca's like, that'd be great. So we're sitting there and we're talking and I'm like, Becca, tell me how are things been going? And she says, well, the move to Atlanta has been good. I said, okay. And I said, well, what else? He goes, well, I found this church and I really, really like it. And I say, that's great. She's plugged into this church. And I said, well, what is it about the church that makes it, you know, what, what is it that, she goes, you know, I think this is the safest church I've ever been to. And I said, that's great. What does that mean? I mean, I think this is great. It's a safe, but I don't know. Can you unpack that for me? What does it mean that this is the safest church? She said, well, she lived in Fort Wayne. When I went to churches in the Midwest, I think there's a lot of people that are managing their image. They come to church and they've got to portray, this is who I am. They put on this armor. They don't want people to see, because if they really see who I am, I don't think they're going to accept me. And, and they're not real. I said, but at this church, I feel like people have the ability to be real. It's safe. I can go there and say, hey, this is who I am. I'm struggling with this stuff. And now that we've broached that, now that we're safe to say those things, now we can work with that. We don't have to be stuck there. We haven't put this armor on that not only protects us, but also keeps us confined into what we are. We can be safe and be who God wants us to be. And I was like, man, that's, that's really good. Is Union Church a safe church? I hope so. I, I feel like it is. But I think there are some things that I'm not going to stand up here and say, hey guys, this is who I am. That might not be safe. But there are groups in my Sunday school class. I feel we're pretty safe. We talk about some real things. In my community group, we try to be real. In, in my, I have a D group, my men's group, and we hold each other accountable. We have to be real there. This is what I'm struggling with. I want this to be a safe place. But I think what happens is is we're scared. If I let somebody in my armor, they're going to hurt me. Right? It's going to hurt. And I think that's fair. Because we've all been hurt. I I thought originally, like, I'll have everybody stand up or raise their hand if they... I'm like, that's silly. It's everybody. What about in the church? Have you been hurt in the church? Once again, probably everybody. So I'm going to apologize again. If I've ever hurt you, please know it wasn't intentional. I accidentally hurt people all the time. I don't mean it. I love you. I don't want to hurt you. So if I've done that, I apologize. If the church has hurt you, and it does it all the time, sometimes on purpose, not our church, I'm talking about Christianity in general, I apologize for that too. Because that's not God. That's people. When I started counseling like in the 90s, there was this uh, saying that was going around called, that they say, hurt people hurt people. Have you heard this before? If I'm hurt, then I might hurt other people. Hurt people hurt people. And it's true. And I think a lot of the times when we've been hurt by other people, it really isn't even about us. It's about them. They're hurt. And I think a lot of it is because they don't know who they are. And I think sometimes we receive that pain 
Because we don't know who we are. We're not sure who we are. So, let's talk about this. I saw this movie a couple weeks ago called Overcomer. And it's by the, I forget their, Kendrick Brothers. They've done like Fireproof and um, Facing the Giants. And what's another one they did? What was their? Yeah, The War Room, Courageous. Maybe some of you have seen some of these movies. Well, their newest one is Overcomer. It's about a girl that runs cross country, but it really is a lot to do with identity. And at one point, the main character, he's a coach, he goes in and he's in a hospital and he accidentally runs, I don't want to do any spoilers, but he ends up in this hospital room with this guy and the guy's blind and they start to have these conversations. And in this conversation, the guy, the blind guy asks him, says, well, he, the main character is a coach and he's losing his team. And he's, he's just, it's devastating him. He's like, but I'm a basketball coach. And now I don't have my team. And it's like, this is my identity. And it's been stolen from me. I don't know what I'm doing. And this guy's like, who are you? It's like, well, I'm a basketball coach. <laughs> he's like, yeah, but strip that away. And what are you? Well, I'm a teacher. And then he goes on, then I'm, I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm, yeah, strip all that stuff away. He goes, well, and, and the guy in the hospital bed's black, and he's why he says, well, I'm a white guy. And he's like, oh, you are that. And, it, <laughs> and he says, but, but what are, he goes, well, I'm a Christian. And he's like, really? Because that was like number, oh, oh, how important is that to you? Well, that's really important. That's like the most important. Because really? Because that was like number eight on your list. Is that really? And I got thinking about it. This wasn't really the thrust of that, but I got thinking, if you take away all these things that I think I am, Lord, because they can all be taken away. I mean, part of my identity, who I think I am, is I'm a teacher. But someday, a counselor. Someday I'm going to retire. Am I still that person then, or am I somebody else now? I'm a father. But two of my children have grown up and moved out. Is that still who I am? I'm a husband. But what if something happens to Julie? Am I, am I still that? Or am I something else now? And I got thinking, where is our identity? Because the world tells us it's all these crazy things. Is it your name? My one daughter just got married. She had to change her name. I think she struggled with that a little bit. That made me happy as a parent that she thinks that being a Getz is something good, but that's not who you are now, right? I mean, she always will be. But you change your name. Is that who you are? Your job, your successes, your failures, your family, your possessions, your passions, your assets? What about this? Is it your relationships? Is that what defines you? Is it making sure that I live up to what my dad expects of me? Is it, is it my race? Because let's face it, in our culture today, Identity politics is a huge thing. They want to put you into a box and say, this is who you are. And our culture marginalizes everybody. I don't care who you think you are, you're on the edge. Why? Is it your sexual identity? That's even got it in it. Like, our, my identity is my sex? Really? You're so much more than that. But our culture is making this thing. Is this making sense to you guys? We see it everywhere. Who are you? Is it your politics? Because right now, if you watch the commercials, this is, they're dividing us. And we're, and we're putting ourselves in, in boxes and marginalizing. And, and what if you put your identity in those things? Is it going to stay? It's transient. So, what if I told you that as a believer, God has already defined your identity? It's already been defined. You don't have to worry about it. Because I remember, and when I went to college, I went to college with a lot of people who said, I'd be like, hey, what are you going to do? What's your main? I don't know. I'm just here to find myself. Do you remember that? That was a big thing for a while. I just have to find myself. 
But I think in a lot of ways, that's just an excuse to experiment with whatever you want. Now, it's nice to figure out, is this something that I'm good at or not good at? You know, if you go do your job shadow and you're like, whoa, that's not what I thought it was. I'm not going to do that. That's good. You do need to find out those things. But our identity has already been defined. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Oh, here's a question. Just kind of dwell on this for a second. What or who have you allowed to define you? What or who? Because if it's achievement, it's only until the next one, right? If it's your past, those things you did in your past, it's going to keep you locked up and you're not going to be able to continue to do what you want to do. Is it a bad relationship? Unfortunately, I've worked with people uh, who've been abused sexually and they've allowed that to define them. Listen, if you're a victim, that's not your fault. That is not who you are. There's so many things that we allow to define us, but God says, no, that is not who you are. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 8. We're going to read through this. And then we'll look at it. Ephesians 1, 3-8, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will to the praise of His glorious grace, which He has freely given us in the One He loves. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And that's powerful. But we're going to do something. We're going to go back and we're going to read those same verses again. But this time, we're just going to key in on who does he say we are? Paul is writing this to this church and he's saying, listen, you guys have forgotten. This is who you are. You were dead, but now you are alive. That's part of your identity. You're alive. But let's go back and do this again. And if you have your Bible, and I'm a big underliner or a circler, when I go back later, I'm going to see these identifiers. I'm going to go, yeah, this is who I am. So back to verse 3. Praise be to God, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. We are blessed. What's the opposite of a blessing? A curse. We live our lives sometimes like we're cursed. Our culture goes around literally cursing people. We are not cursed. We are, this is you. You're blessed. In the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us. We are chosen. I watch kids at recess every day walk around by themselves. I work very hard at trying to connect people because they feel rejection every day. I remember in high school, walking into the cafeteria, and even though I had friends thinking, boy, I hope I have somebody to sit with. Does anybody remember this? The rejection. Or, since I work in an elementary school, I watch them choose teams for kickball. And you know these kids that are like, they're going to pick me last. Right? There's rejection. That is not you. You are chosen. You are chosen. Verse 4. He chose us in Him before the creation of the world. He didn't choose you last. He chose you before the creation. You're already chosen. To be holy and blameless. Holy and blameless. Do we still sin? Yes. But that is not who we are. He calls us saints. We're holy and blameless. We are not dirty and ashamed. 
How much of our life have we lived being, feeling dirty and ashamed? Or my heart breaks for people who don't realize you were dead, but you could be alive. And in being alive, you don't have to feel dirty and ashamed anymore. They're living their whole life over here, dirty and ashamed. Don't. Don't do it. It's not who you are. Verse 5. In love, He predestined us for adoption. Adoption. We are children of God. We are princes and princesses, children of the King. You are adopted, not orphans. I think how often my mom and dad, I love them, but they're, they're earthly people. And when we do it right, it gives us a vision of what our Heavenly Father is like. But they're not our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father isn't going to, I don't know, disappoint you, let you down. You are adopted. In accordance with His pleasure and will, to the praise of His glorious grace, He has freely given us in the one He loves. Verse 7. In Him we have redemption. Redemption. We have been bought with a price. He's pulled us out of bondage. We were slaves under the law. But we're redeemed. We're under grace now. This is all good. You guys should be smiling. This is good stuff. This is who you are. You are redeemed. Through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. We are forgiven. Man, circle that one. We are not guilty and condemned. We are forgiven. I was thinking about this. We were talking about this a little bit in our life group the other day, but I, I watch these politicians that are running, and then somebody says, you know what? We were looking at your yearbook, and we saw this picture of you doing something. And I'm like, wow. Is that who they are? We're going to judge somebody by something they did when they were a teenager and... That's not who you are. And I'm going to tell you this. I've done some things that I regret a lot. But I also thank God for them. Because of those things, it's changed who I am. The person I am today is somewhat because of the mistakes that I've made, right? If I took away all my mistakes, I'm not going to be this person. I'm probably still living in a life that's not not good. So yeah, we're going to make mistakes. Everybody does. But that doesn't mean you quit. That means you go, well, that didn't work. Now we're going to do it a different way. And that's the beauty of living in a world where you're alive. Forgiven. You're not guilty and condemned. So, the world. It's identity for you is very subjective i feel like everybody gets to come up with their idea of who they're going to decide this is who you are so you talk to one person and they're like well this is who you are and talk this is who you are. you can't hit that it's a moving target your identity is objective it's concrete god has told you who you are and if you forget look at it again because we forget all the time the world is marginalizing. God is saying, no. I, have, I paid a price so that you can be this person. Now live like it. Live like it. Because here's the thing. God loves you just the way you are. He accepts you just the way you are. Now here's the kicker. And some of you might have a problem with this. He loves you right now with whatever you have, the baggage, the brokenness, the messed upness, because we all have it. But He loves you enough to change you. So when my kids were teenagers, we struggled with this. Why can't you just love me the way I am? And I say, I do. You don't understand. There is absolutely nothing you can do that's going to make me love you any less. When you were born... You were helpless, and I instantly fell in love. That has never changed. 
You can't do anything that's going to make me love you less. But the opposite is true. You can't do anything that's going to make me love you anymore either. Because I love you. Now, there's things you do that I don't like. I definitely don't love some of those things you do. But that is not who you are. That's something you do. I love you. God loves you. He took you right where you were and said, yes, redeemed, while you were yet a sinner. I... But here's the good news. He loves us enough that he's going to change us. So let me put this in perspective. So, when I was born, my mom loved me just the way I was. However, when I was a baby, and I don't want to upset anybody, but I was in diapers and I wasn't potty trained. And she loved me even though she had to change those diapers and deal with this mess in my life. But at some point, she said, son, I love you just the way you are, but let's get you potty trained. She wanted to change me. Why? Because I needed to mature. I needed to grow up to become the man. Because let's be honest, if I still wasn't potty trained, Julie, Julie loves me just the way I am, but that could have been a deal breaker. <laughs> Sometimes God takes us where we are and says, I love you. But listen, you're not done growing yet. You need to mature into the person you need to be. I love you enough to help you be the man or woman of God that you were always meant to be. Does this make sense? Sometimes, sometimes the change is this. I love you just the way you are, but what you're doing isn't healthy. This isn't healthy. I need you to do something that's going to make yourself more healthy. I need to change you. It's sin. Don't stay there. Or it's just not common sense. Don't live here. I need you to change. But my kids call and say, yeah, I've been staying up till four in the morning and then I get up and go to work at nine. And I'm like, yeah, that's not healthy. You need to change that. Can't you just love? Yes, of course I love you. But because I love you, I want you to be healthy. God wants us to be healthy. You have to listen. So here's the deal. I've been listening really hard to God lately. And you know, I'm all this. I got this all figured out. And God's looking at me going, oh, I'm glad you're listening because there's some things you need to change. Ron, grow up. Okay. Ron, this isn't healthy. You need to do these things. And it's amazing because the Holy Spirit speaks to me in this voice that sounds just like Julie. <laughs> you guys can relate, right? The Lord is changing me. He's changing the way I drive. He's changing the way I... Okay, so... Yeah, you guys laugh, but this is real. Well, let me talk to you a minute about non-Christians too. Because if you're a believer, you're saying, okay, God, I, I'm going to let you be not just my Savior, but my Lord. All right? You're in charge. So we expect some of this. I think sometimes we get out of our lane though, and, and we talk to non-Christians and we're like, hey, you need to live your life this way. We need to stay out of that. We're not asked to tell non-Christians how to live. They haven't signed up for that. What we need to do is say, I need to introduce you to Jesus. Because He can bring the dead to life. Once they accept that, once they become a part of this family, then the Holy Spirit's going to deal with them. That's not our job. Let me give you this example to kind of help maybe clarify that a little bit. Um, so, my son Ronald, he'll be here in the second service, but uh, he has a disability. And so we always kind of watch after him a little bit extra. Well, one time at school, uh, I was doing something at the end of the day, and he disappeared. And he was gone. And I'm like, okay, he's just over here in the hallway. Or he's talking to his sweetheart, Mrs. Braden. Or he's, I don't know, whatever. But I, so I go in here. Oh, he's not here. 
That's okay. He's probably, he's not here. He's not here. And all of a sudden, uh, my anxiety starts to amp up a little bit. Because who, who knows? If he decides to make a bad choice, I, I, and I think, well, he's not in the building. Where is he? And I've got other people looking. So we're all looking for him. Ronald, where are you? And, and then I'm outside the building. And I'm running around. And I'm, wh- but where do you go? I mean, do you start just walking randomly, hoping you're going to run into him? Because I have no idea. They always say, if you're trying to find something, think like the thing you're trying to find, right? If I were keys, where would I be? No, I don't. But where would Ron? I have no idea. Now I'm starting to panic. And as I'm running, I'm praying, God, you, I'm lost. I, he's gone. I don't know. Please help me find him. But then the other part of me is thinking, I, I can't go home. Hey, well, Julie, I lost Ronald today, but I, I'm going to call home and be like, yeah, so I can't find Ronald. And she's going to be like, what kind of father are you? I don't know, bad. I, I, this is, I'm starting to panic. And I'm getting very worried. Lord, please help me find him. So eventually, this has a happy ending. Eventually, we find him. And at school, there's this one, there's these little staircases that go upstairs to these old locker rooms. He's upstairs in the locker room, in a locker, and he's got his toys, and he's talking to him in his locker. He was never in any distress. He was never worried. He's having a great time, but I am in a flat-out panic because I love him. I want him to be okay. I find him. I'm crying. I'm scared. I'm hugging him. You know what never went through my head? Well, wherever he is, Lord, I hope he's following the rules. Or, you know what? I just really, really hope he's not making a mess wherever he is. Or, oh, uh, when I find... You know what? I think God's that way with... Un- As a matter of fact, I know he is. When someone is not in the family, when they're still dead and they're not alive, he's like, I just need them back. Yes, they're living their life this way. That's not the most important thing because right now they're dead. Right now, I just need to make sure they're going to be alive. Now, now that they're alive, He loves you as you are, but He loves you enough to change you. Does this make sense? All right. One last thing. Oops, I went too far. Who you are is not based on feelings. Because I run into this a lot too. I run into this personally. Some days, I don't feel loved. I don't feel chosen. I don't feel redeemed. I don't feel holy. I don't feel... It doesn't matter. It doesn't change the concrete nature of the identity that I have in Christ. This is how He sees me. I need to live my life this way. Because let's be honest, some days I don't feel like going to work, but I still do. Some days I don't feel like making dinner, but I still do. Some days I don't feel like being a dad or a husband, or, but guess what? You do it. Feelings change. Your identity doesn't. This is who you are. So the next time you're getting down and you're feeling like, God, who am I? Remind yourself. There's a thing in your bulletin, who I am in Christ, some verses. I don't know, write some down. Put them on your mirror. Remind yourself. I, this isn't any magic list. I just did a Google search. There's a ton of them. Who I am in Christ, list. Or my identity in Christ, a list. This guy, um, Neil Anderson, I read one of his books called Bondage Breaker. So I'm like, oh, I'll just use this one. This is just a tool. Remind yourself who you are. Camille gave me a bookmark uh, yesterday. She has them for the kids. She did it, this with the kids. Your identity in Christ. She has these bookmarks that she gives to the kids so that they can re- be reminded. You are not who they say you are on the playground. You are not who you are when you're in trouble. You are not. This is who you are. Live your life like this. So remind yourself. It is not subjective. It is concrete. Oops, we're going to skip that one. So, now, let's talk about communion. Because today we're going to have communion. 
And the reason we do this is because we forget. We always forget. God knows that we forget. And he wrote this in 1 Corinthians. Elders, if you guys are going to come help serve, kind of come up now. He, he wrote this in 1 Corinthians. He says, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance. Do this in rem- remember. Because we forget all the time. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Remember. So we've started doing communion more often now because we need to remember. He gave this sacrifice for us. We are not who we were. Because remember this, because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. So we do open communion here at Union Church, which means that if you're a believer, please take communion. Remember, He forgave your sins. You are chosen. He paid the price. You are redeemed. Guys, you can come up and hand that out. So as you take communion today, I want you to think about this. He paid a price, but we need to remember who we are in Christ. So let's pray and then you guys can hand those out. Father God, thank You so much that You have defined our identity in You. That we don't have to be constantly searching and filling and thinking and who am I? Lord, we know. We just have to remember and then live our lives that way. Thank You so much that You loved us enough, that You loved us the way we are, but You also love us enough to change us. Challenge us, Lord. Help us to be the men and women of God that you want us to be. Amen.